do that. I know, I know, but even do that for that. Okay. All right. It's a good. It's a good point. We need. We. Uh, really. So you're saying we're not live because before you said we are. So there's there's him saying we are live, and then YouTube. And there should be a second signal when YouTube agrees with you. Okay. Okay. And audio is good. All right. <laughs> Just oh, those are my notes for the other one. Hey. All right. Well, let's uh, start by praying. Our heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this topic, um, that of you directing all things to your ends, your designs, your goals. And as we look out in nature, we see that this is part of what you mean, that the heavens declare your glory and the skies above proclaim your handiwork. We pray that as we look not only at the skies, but also to human action and to the intricate way that you have designed us and formed us in the womb, uh, the animal kingdoms, the plants, all these different things, Lord, that you have designed and that you have evidenced yourself in the creation. I pray that you would um, direct us that uh, our end in this study would be your glory and that we would be better prepared uh, to uh, chart out the rest of this course in this whole summer. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, as indicated, this is the fifth of the arguments, at least the way that I'm breaking this up, the teleological argument. Uh, the, the outline for tonight, very simple, three parts. Well, for this session, three parts. We're going to look at, first of all, the Thomistic version of the teleological argument, Thomas's, and that has to do with natural directedness toward certain ends. Then we're going to look, secondly, at a more evidential form of that that's more famous today, uh, courtesy of the intelligent design movement. But it's most famous historically in William Paley's natural theology, his um, uh, metaphor of the watchmaker, which Richard Dawkins uh, tried to turn around with the blind watchmaker. Uh, so that's the second. So the, the first deals with directedness per se and the nature of the thing, whereas the second looks more at the evidence of the intricacy for what Paley called contrivance, uh, the, the functions that different pieces of any particular, whether it's a living organism or anything else, but especially living organisms. Uh, and then thirdly, we're going to just field some objections and evaluations and most of the objections will be kind of answered already as we go on. But uh, as I said, um, like the cosmological argument, there's two basic forms here. Uh, you have modern evidentialism uh, that has reasoned in a different way than the classical argument. Although I would say, and this is where I part ways with Phaser a little bit, depending on what all he means, because um, I can't crawl inside his head and see if he's being a little bit too hard on... Uh, the intelligent design folks, but uh, at any rate, um, I don't think we have to pit these against each other. Um, the uh, the classical view, Thomas's way of arguing this versus you know what intelligent design tries to look at evidentially. Um, they they both start with things that you observe in the world, so that part of it's not uh, different. So I would say don't pit these against each other. Um, what we do need to do is recognize that there are different forms of argumentation. Uh, there's different forms. And so we need to recognize that, and we need to use them accordingly uh, in diverse settings, depending on what our... Um, and that's why you have to know and appreciate both, because your objection might be... Uh, the objection you're fielding might be an objection against, uh, you know, uh, Bill Dembski or Stephen Meyer is really one of the big guys now. Um, and, and so uh, that might be the objection, or it might be an objection against Thomas. Usually it's not going to be an objection against Thomas, because nobody, uh, as proved every time Richard Dawkins or any of them open their mouth, they don't really understand what they're... What, what they've never read uh, Thomas's view, and that's evident. Uh, for whatever it's worth, Immanuel Kant um, rated the design argument, along with the moral argument, as higher than the others, even though he criticized all of them. Um, but clearly, even when he uh, said that, he meant it in an entirely subjective way. There's a famous statement by Kant that there's two things that fill me with ever-increasing awe and wonder, the starry skies above me and the moral law within me. And that relates to the design argument and the moral argument. Kant 
you know, thought the moral argument was really the only possible one that would work. Well, whatever. Um, but, but subjectivity aside, the argument from design, no less than the argument for an objective right and wrong that we looked at last week, is precisely an objective appeal. We're not saying simply that nature has a capacity to inspire us like we're a bunch of poets and to think transcendent thoughts or anything like that. It's going to mean something different from one person to another to begin with. But rather, what we mean is that all of the perfectly real objects of nature exhibit all of the qualities of being produced by the ultimate mind. Or in the Thomistic mold, uh, they, they bear the evidence of being formed with the objective tendency to be, to be perfected, um, according to the natures that require a sufficient cause to do all of that intending. So let's dig into this. Uh, I drew a picture to start off with, just to remind ourselves of the four causes of Aristotle. This circle represents any particular thing, anything that's an effect, okay? So anything that does not have the cause of its, or <laughs> the reason for its existence in itself um, is, could, it could be this, anything, okay? Everything has, that's, that's an effect, has an efficient cause, that's the main actor, it could be a person or a non-person, doesn't matter, uh, everything has a form and a matter. And you remember the disagreement Aristotle had with Plato? He said, yes, there is such a thing as the form of a thing, the essence of a thing, but that has to do with those are always material particulars. He, there's exceptions, okay? But then this one, and this is where we get the word teleological, the Greek word telos is a biblical example, Romans 10, 4. Christ is the telos of the law. That word is used. Christ is the end of the law for all who believe. What does that mean? Does that just mean the end of a book? No. It means the goal, like the bullseye of a target, right? So that's what that Greek word, a lot of different, um, and you'll probably hear me go back and forth, different synonyms, and design, aim, motive. I don't know. Uh, I said goal already, but, but those are all words that are going to mean the same thing. So when we talk about the teleological argument, we're going to be talking about an argument that observes things in nature with a tendency to uh, come to some final, and that's another synonym that uh, Aristotelians use for the end cause is the final cause for that reason too, because a thing comes to fruition in a sense. In, in a sense, the end product that you see on the shelf in the universe the thing has, has come into act, okay? So what does Thomas mean by his argument? His argument is going to focus on natural directedness. The end cause, in a sense, is going to be the cause of causes, which you might, you're like, wait a minute, the efficient cause gets number one here. This gets number four, or if we add instrumental, this is number five on the assembly line. What, do you, what, what would Thomas mean by calling the end cause the cause of causes. Well, we'll come to that, but let's get a little bit of grammar first. First thing we have to get in our minds is this notion of end or final cause. Phaser sets us on the right path by saying this. I say pay careful attention to this and you'll get a little bit of the grammar. For Aristotelians, for people that pay attention to Aristotle, our conscious thought processes are only a special case of the more general phenomenon of goal directedness or final causality. Let me pause there. That's important because one of the objections against teleology in science, for example, is, oh, so an acorn says to itself, must, must find a squirrel, must find a squirrel. Uh, no, that's a caricature. We're not saying that everything in order to be directed to an end has an intelligent end in its own, like it's conscious. That's a, that's a straw man. Okay, so that, that's an important point. Our conscious thought, or anything that has consciousness, is only a special case of the more general phenomenon of goal directedness or final causality. Sorry, it's such an important concept. I have another picture I just came up with. Um, this circle represents all directed things. This circle represents conscious of their directedness. I don't like that. 
because an atheist is in this circle and he's not, he won't admit that he is being directed. So I'll say a conscious of their ends because everybody would at least say, I have ends, I have goals, okay? Okay, so in teleology, some of the things that are goal-directed are conscious of their end. Crucial point, so I drew that other picture. Anyway, let's go back to phaser. Um, which exist in the natural world in a way that is mostly divorced. So this circle is actually bigger. The, the number of things that are impersonal in the world is much bigger than the things that are uh, personal in that sense. Okay, so uh, which in the, in the natural world in a way that is mostly divorced from any conscious mind or intelligence. To intend an end, therefore, in the sense that Aquinas has in mind, in the fifth way, what he means by to intend an end is not necessarily to make a conscious decision to pursue some goal, but rather just to have a natural inclination towards something. And once you get that in your mind, you realize, oh, what, how many things, what amount, what percentage of things that exist are directed to a goal? Oh, anything that moves. Oh, everything. Everything. When you understand that that's what's meant by directedness, you realize... Oh, if, there's, if, if a thing is moved and moving at all, it has a, it's a thing, therefore it has a nature. That nature is what it is and not something else. That nature comes into act. That's why you see it on the shelf of the universe, the finished product, okay? So this applies to everything. So right away, all the people like Dawkins and, and all the rest that are arguing against uh, this argument, they, they have no clue what they're talking about. Uh, they, they've missed this most important part of the argument, which is the definition. Two extreme errors, flushing out the same thing. Um, two extreme errors in thinking about final cause. The first is to assume that teleological thinking means that each efficient cause has a mind, or that the formal cause, the thing in itself has a mind. We already took care of that. So that's one extreme, that each of these things, in order to have a goal, the rock, again, the rock falling, oh yeah, must fall, must fall, must fall. Okay, and so, well, if that's not what it, it's meant, then the other extreme is to see that and to say, okay, if that's not what's meant by goal or, or final causality, um, since most efficient causes in the universe don't have minds, then there has to be only two kinds of things. Those tending so towards some end, driven by intelligence, and then perfectly natural things, which clearly are not. But that's really kind of assuming the same setup, that kind of simplistic division, why it was imposed by modern thinkers, really before Dawkins and the new atheists came around uh, during the Enlightenment, uh, starting with Francis Bacon, in, in a sense. So back to the 17th century, you had this misappropriation of what Aristotle was saying. And so um, this was stripped from science. Um, you had no more final as the, the main thing that had to be stripped from science. Because what they heard was, God is feeding the squirrel. Therefore, he doesn't have oxygen and he's not to respirate. To give what? How do you, what? But that's what they heard. Because they heard that in order for things to have an end, that meant that this thing is saying must, must fall, must fall, must fall. And that totally misunderstands. Now, I'm simplifying a bit there. But they're, they're taking personality out of, um, because all science deals with is sort of the bottom the bottom shelf, uh, things on the surface, uh, describing how nature happens to work. But anyway, teleology was banished from modern science. And in the same way, this corresponding argument for God's existence was misconstrued. So, if that's the misunderstanding, how do we set the right definition here? What is a natural tendency? If, if a tendency does not require every cause to say to itself, I intend... This is what we usually mean by intention. That's an intelligent thing, right? So if that's not what's necessarily meant, what does natural tendency actually mean? In what sense does it apply to everything that moves? And how does this function in Thomas's fifth way to show God's existence? Well, simply stated, the natural tendency of every single thing, here's my definition, the perfection of the thing in virtue of what it is. The perfection of the thing in virtue of what it is. And end would be, in that sense, not so much a synonym for it, but by the way, this is crucially important for natural law, incidentally. Um, 
the perfection of a thing and conversely a defect of that thing. And that applies to moral defects. You know, think of same-sex marriage, which is a, a square circle. Um, this actually is relevant to that. We won't get deeply into how it's relevant to that till we get to our doctrine of man. But at any rate, this thing, um, there is an idea, and that's what formal cause means. That idea, like a blueprint to a house. You can have a perfect blueprint, and a, and a builder can mess up, right? And something like that. And at that point, you have a defect, but the defect is not disprove the perfect, it actually proves it. Because you can't have a defect unless there's a perfect. That's what defect means, something uh, missing there, right? And so uh, evolutionists will make this very mistake. Uh, oh, a cat's a four-legged thing. What about that three-legged cat over there? Right, that's a defect, okay, which assumes a form. Okay, by the way, Dawkins spent his whole first chapter in uh, the greatest show on earth, absolutely, first of all, botching what this is, but he was arguing against essentialism and against Plato. And he's like, really? He's a biologist. Why would he want to do that? Because he's, he's complaining against this fixity of species, this idea of an essence of species, essence of kinds, that they have a form and so forth. Um, but anyway, well, you'll, you'll see that when you see some of the objections to intelligent design. But that's my definition. Natural tendency means the perfection of the thing in virtue of what it is. And so its perfection is according to its nature. Its, its nature is actualized. And so really, it's a little bit more grammar here. Now this circle is going to be a, a blow up of this. Okay, so this is, remember, you have, uh, let's do this. Let's do... Uh, a, a dotted one right before it. It came right before. And this is the, remember, potency and act. We've talked about this. This is potentially this. This is the finished form on the shelf. This is the perfection of the thing, but in virtue of what it is. Uh, the perfection of a kitten will not be a, a, a really great chicken. It'll, it'll, be a, a, it'll be a cat, okay? The, the perfection of a thing. Okay, I'm using goofy examples, but you get the idea, okay? But you need other things here. You need an external principle. You need, remember, uh, Aristotelians, and this goes back to the cosmological argument, you need something already in act to reduce what is potential to uh, the actual. Okay? But this is the same thing. This is just a, you know acorn tree, whatever um, example you want to use. And if you state it this way, all of a sudden, it would seem that every single thing that is both Act and potency must have a tendency, a natural tendency. For example, there is a reason why 100 times out of 100, if I throw a rock against a window pane, it never once becomes a bouquet of flowers at or before impact. I may wish that it would. Um, it may not break it every time but not because the nature of either the glass or the rock fundamentally changed, okay? This has, a, this has a basic nature, all right? That's actually, I think that's an example Fazer uses in his book on Aquinas. It's been a couple years since I read that one, but I, I found it very helpful when he was arguing against Hume. Um, there was a debate in, uh, among the medievalists. Um, Thomas wasn't the only school in scholasticism. There was others that followed um, the Scotists and the Suarezians, um, those are two other schools that they were realist, but they had disagreements with Thomas over something. Um, they basically argued against the Thomas and said um, that the limitations of a thing's actuality, in other words, the limitations, that solid line, the, the sum total of all that it can be, um, the limitations of it have to do with the efficient cause of the thing. Okay, now the, 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 the in other words, what comes outside, the external principle. All right, this, this potency, is what we mean by the nature of the thing. It has the potential to become this, right? And so they were arguing that this is where the show is at, the extrinsic principle. Thomas weren't denying the extrinsic principle, but they said that this matters for all the world, the intrinsic principle, the nature of the thing. This is so important for natural law, so please don't think this is just sort of a the just grammar for natural theology. This is crucial for natural law. Um, almost nobody understands this. It's so frustrating, which is why we need to... Um, people are dying because of this. I'll come back to that. Dead serious. Um, fa fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, skip, skip, skip. Um, all that, okay, that's, that's, that's a metaphysical mouthful right there. I, I tried to make it as simple as possible, but that's a lot of stuff there. Let's bring it down. Um, 
Let me summarize this by saying that the, that the end of a thing, whatever that thing is, the end of a thing, what you see on the shelf of the world moment by moment is the real nature of the thing actualized. And that means that its form was informed by another. Okay? The form of this thing having the exact perfection that it did from the nature that it has was informed by another. Now, I'm not going to go too fast and say its tendency was intended by another. Um, <clears throat> notice, by the way, <coughs> I'm going to cheat a little bit, <coughs> but I don't think it's cheating too much. Notice the similarity between the words information and form and <coughs> intention and tendency, or just tend. Okay, note, do you notice that? That is not a language trick. Um, notice that both of these needed to go in. Okay, you know that from a computer program. It didn't just drop out of the sky. Okay, it didn't just because of the demand, sort of a Keynesian view of, of uh, computer programs, that demand creates its supply. No, it had to come out of a mind of uh, somebody that was actually cooler than the people that wanted the game to be played. It had to come out of the imagination of the, of the programmer. Okay? And so you have a, a tending into or a forming into, and this is why I don't separate the Thomistic view from the, uh, from the intelligent design view, because these things are very closely associated with each other. But um, the tendency must be caused because the tendency is an effect. If the tendency is an effect, and this follows from the cosmological, yes, it's borrowing from it, it is. I have no problem with that. Um, if every effect must have a cause and a tendency is an effect, then a tendency must have a cause. Everybody following me so far here? Okay. And so nothing which is intended can set its own tendency. Nothing which is intended can set its own tendency tendency. All right, with those basics in mind, now I'm going to read you the argument of Aquinas. I'll leave that up there. And then we'll look at a, at a summary of it. Okay, the argument itself, I should have had a place marker. I waste too much time here. Okay, fifth way. The fifth way is taken from the governance of the world. We see that things which lack intelligence, stop, he goes right to things with lo which lack intelligence. That should have tipped off Dawkins right there. He doesn't go to things which you are to take him to mean must fall, must fall. He goes right to things that don't have intelligence. That's a massive clue. Anyway, we see that things that lack intelligence, such as natural bodies, act for an end. And this is evident from their acting always or nearly always in the same way so as to obtain the best results. Think of the rock going to the window pane. 100 times out of 100. It tends to do a certain thing. It tends not to turn into a bouquet of flowers. Sorry. In the same way, so as to intend the best result. Hence, it is plain that not fortuitously, but designedly, do they achieve their ends. Now, whatever lacks intelligence cannot move towards an end unless it be directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence as the arrow is shot to its mark by the archer. Therefore, some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end, and this being we call God. I can think of an objection already, but don't worry, we're going to answer it. Um, here's a summary of what you just heard. Premise one, we see that natural bodies work towards some goal and do not do so by chance. Now stop right there. Lots of people think of a, a book called Chance and Necessity um, maybe in the 60s, which is odd. Uh, but, it, but anybody has, a, a, you, know, you know, oh, how'd that happen? By chance. What are they doing there? They're ascribing metaphysical uh, essence to chance. Chance is a, is a mathematical word. It describes something in probability. It, it's, it, you don't, it's not an entity with causal power. Um, uh, read R.C. Sproul's book, uh, Not a Chance, and get straightened out about that if you want to, but uh, that's the first premise. We see natural bodies work towards some goal and do not do so by chance. In other words, they, have, they do so by nature. Most natural things lack knowledge. Three, 
But as an arrow reaches its target because it is directed by an archer, what lacks intelligence achieves goals by being directed by something intelligent. For, therefore, some intelligent being exists by whom all natural things are directed to their end, and this being we call God. Now, I see a weakness. I don't think it's a weakness, but, you could, but this is what I would do if I was a skeptic, and it's what people tend to do. This is, this is a part-to-whole fallacy uh, that Aquinas is doing. Uh, if you look at premise three, the word as, as an arrow reaches its target. Um, so here's a, oh, there we go, it's already there. Here's the target. Here's the arrow, here's the archer, you get the idea. There's his hand or something, I don't know. There's the arrow. It's going this way. As the arrow. So this is a particular thing, right? Let me get a different color. Just as this part of the sample of all things that are directed, just as this unintelligent thing needed to be directed by this intelligent thing, just as that so all things directed. Aha! Aquinas is committing the part to whole fallacy or the fallacy of composition. What's true of the part is true of the whole. They're not really parts of a whole, but it, you call it a generalization. Some kind of a generalization fallacy is happening here. Okay? False analogy. Whatever. Something's happening. Something's fishy. Um, in other words, what he's saying is that we must conclude that all non-intelligent tendencies obtain their directedness in the same way. See, nobody doubts that um, uh, thing like a computer program or something like that. Nobody doubts, uh, atheist or theist, that that thing was directed by an intelligent agent. The question is, what about all the things that are, um, that are driven by natural tendencies that it's already built in, so forth, okay? Must we conclude that all natural, or sorry, non-intelligent tendencies obtain their directedness in the same way as the arrow does from the archer? Well, I'm going to return to that little uh, suspense for you, uh, because uh, I want to answer that, because that part to whole fallacy charge is laid against some of the other proofs, too, so I'm going to do that in the wrap-up. But we call this final cause, the end cause, the cause of causes, because efficient causes can be of two kinds. And by the way, going through this is going to give you another angle or another way to make the teleological argument, e even the Thomistic kind. Um, efficient causes can be of one of two kinds. Do I want to do, I wanna do a little chart here, a little? Yes, I do. Make some time up here. Um, of efficient causes, I gotta remember what my. Uh, you have intelligent and non intelligent. I have to abbreviate for time's sake. Of intelligent causes, you have volitional action and. No, sorry, voluntary action and involuntary action, although it cash out the same way. Um, and then, uh, I should have just read it instead of saying that. Okay, so with that chart in mind, uh, I'll add to it in a second. Um, as we go on to demonstrate, the first cause must, in addition to being pure act, he's got to be a bunch of other things. And so what, what I'm going to do with this chart here is just, is just do a little bit of, uh, you know, not so much a logic tree, but just to show you uh, what we have to work with. Um, by, by showing that, uh, what else the first cause must be, we're going to see something about intelligence and directedness and so forth, okay? Uh, and what we're going to show is that, um, at the end of it, is that um, it follows that this being's only possible goal in bringing about all of the diverse tendencies is himself. Um, if this being is simple and impassable, and one in essence and decree, then the only possible goal he could have is something in himself. But before we go too fast, this chart is going to come into play. Um, all parties would agree that of things in this world, there's two kinds of efficient causes, intelligent and non-intelligent. Of the intelligent causes, all parties would admit uh, design and intention, and they would likewise acknowledge that there's two kinds of actions in intelligent beings, voluntary and involuntary. Of those that are involuntary, most would allow that there's a complex um, of prior causation, uh, that there's intelligence involved. Uh, it could manifest itself in the subconscious, in the habitual, and so forth. 
But then of this last, this is the one we're most interested in, the voluntary, by definition, there's action and there's a reason for action. I'm not going to draw this like a logic chart. I'm going to draw this like a Venn diagram. There's, um, there's action and then there's reason or goal or the end of the action, right? And this is why it's called the cause of causes. Um, whatever means the actor employs for his action, um, there's an end involved. There's a goal. So in other words, if there's no goal, there would be no means, right? Does that make sense? Like if I, if, if I said to you, why are you going to the store? And, and you said, uh, you know what? I don't know. I forgot. You'd probably be less likely to actually make the trip, all right? So it's just an everyday example. So without the reason, there's no action. And consequently, the reason for action, the end, is a necessary condition, and it becomes a cause of the action. So this becomes a cause of this. So this is happening to, to obtain this. And so when we're talking about intelligent beings, the reason intelligent beings act is to obtain some end. So there's a sense in which, in a very real sense in which, the end is drawing the actor, okay? Keep that in mind weeks from now when we get to the glory of God, and we'll show you that. Anyway, let's not go too fast. Um, but here's where it turns into another argument. If there is no ultimate end of emotion, let's do it like this. Actor, more, the most immediate act you could think of right there. He has an end. Now that end is the ultimate end. You can call it a chief end. Okay? Over here, let's put that there. Over here, you have a means to gain that end. And let's just pretend that you had many means to gain that end because you work it out in various scenarios and you'd have that situation. Okay? So if there was no ultimate end, there would be no what's called a penultimate end. Um, in other words, an, an end that's pretty high up there, but actually is meant to achieve some greater result. If there's no end motion, there'd be no subordinate motions. In other words, what we saw about in the cosmological argument about the impossibility of infinite regress, no matter which direction we're talking about, with respect to first causes, that also is true with respect to final causes. And here's a really funny thing about this. Even an atheist like Ayn Rand actually saw this when it came to the motion of an individual rational agent. And then she just stopped and didn't go far enough. It was in her book, The Virtue of Selfishness. Uh, let me just read you this paragraph by Rand. I find it fascinating. Rand says this, and oh, by the way, she was a, an admirer of Aristotle and even of Aquinas in a certain way, to the degree that he followed Aristotle. None of the mystical stuff, though. Um, anyway, um, Rand says, an ultimate value is that final goal or end to which all lesser goals are the means. And it sets the standard by which all lesser goals are evaluated. An organism's life is its standard of value. That's where she goes wrong. But anyway, it becomes subjectivism. Strangely, her philosophy is called objectivism. But that's the problem right there, if you want to know. An organism's life is its standard of value. That which furthers its life is the good, that which threatens it is the evil. Now you think, okay, I disagree with her there. Why are we even reading this then? Here it comes. Wait for it. Without an ultimate goal or end, there can be no lesser goal or means. A series of means going off into an infinite progression toward a non-existent end is a metaphysical and epistemological impossibility. Ayn Rand, are you saying that if there was no ultimate goal or purpose, then there would be no motion in the actor. Now, I, I think what she would say is yes, of individual life forms. But we would commit the part to whole fallacy if we extended that to the purpose, capital T, capital P. But I think what we can do once we see what's wrong with the charge of the fallacy of composition, part to whole, once we see what's wrong with that, we're going to realize, wait a minute, if there is no ultimate end to all motion, then no motion would have ever arisen, even of falling leaves and rocks. We'll come back to that. Okay, that's the Thomistic argument in a nutshell. It has to do with the nature of things and their directedness. 
And once you realize what that means, you realize, oh, that just means everything moving. There's no way around that. If that's all you meant, well, that is what we meant. Okay, second way to argue this, the intelligent design um, inference, um, and it's most famously uh, found in William Paley's book, Natural Theology. One of the coolest covers ever, by the way. Where is it? Yeah, I like it. I don't know who's, you ever see that picture? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like it. It's uh, Oxford uh, University Press, uh, Paley. And Paley was a sharp guy. Um, Darwin read him and, and knew that he was uh, somebody to be reckoned with. Here's Paley's basic argument. It's right at the beginning of natural theology. He says, in crossing a heath, suppose I pitched my foot against a stone and were asked how the stone came to be there. I might possibly answer that for anything I knew to the contrary, it had lain there forever nor would it perhaps be very easy to show the absurdity of this answer. But suppose I had found a watch upon the ground, and it should be inquired how the watch happened to be in that place. I should hardly think of the answer which I had given before. Yet why should not this answer serve for the watch as well as for the stone? For this reason, and for no other, that when we come to inspect the watch, we perceive what we could not discover in the stone, that its several parts are framed and put together for a purpose. In other words, that they are so formed and adjusted as to produce motion, and that that motion so regulated as to point out the hour of that day. That if the several parts had been differently shaped than what they are, of a different size than what they are, or places after any other manner or in any other order than that in which they are placed, either no motion at all would have been carried on in the machine or none which would have answered the use that is now served by it, end quote. Now, embedded in this explanation of the watch that he stumbles into um, are two pillars of later intelligent design theory, namely, and I'll put these on the, whoa. Okay, give me a sec. By the way, let's do, and let's leave that there. Let's do the part to whole, let's set them up for a part to whole fallacy. Let's uh, take it on right from the beginning. Um, rock, watch, yeah. and then um, let's infer from that about all things. Just like Thomas was accused of saying, are you going to be the archer and the arrow? Everything has to work that way? Okay, let's go this way and this way and this way. Um, but anyway, two things, two definitions I'm going to throw at you a little bit later, but let me introduce them now because they show up in Paley's reasoning. One is called irreducible complexity. And this was made famous by Michael Behe in his book written in the 1990s, Darwin's Black Box. This one is, a, is the problem for natural selection. selection. So this is, this is what we would call a, a difficulty. Um, we're going to introduce another definition, a specified complexity. And uh, in many ways, this was already there, anybody that deals in cryptology. Interestingly, I just, I didn't know this. Francis Crick, one of the co-founders of DNA, was a, um, what do they call him? A code breaker is a normal name, but there's probably a more specialized name for it. They study cryptology or whatever, um, ciphers. Uh, there's a name for it. Anyway, um, he did that in World War II before, and sure enough, I'm not surprised that he was able to see a pattern in those four uh, acids and, and the, the building the proteins and so on. Uh, anyway, because we'll look at that, we'll see why that is. Uh, this, uh, this, we're just going for a definition for what intelligent design is. So, we'll come back to that, but I just want to put it there now because it's, it's already there in Paley's definition and Paley's argument. Um, but if you want a simple form of the design argument, um, you can make it as succinct as the other ones. And I'm going to have to cheat a little bit because I think there's a, there's a two-premise and conclusion way to say it that I don't think is sufficient. It opens it elf, itself up to uh, objections, and I hope you can see this. So premise one, in the universe we see design. Premise two, design implies an intelligence or designer. Oh, boy. <laughs> Bing. Let's do it. Let's just be concise here. Design implies a designer. Right now, all we're talking about is any design. 
And that becomes the problem. That becomes open to the part to whole fallacy. You can kind of see it already if you don't put another premise in. So I'm going to do that. Third premise, the universe as a whole evidence is design. Oh. You see the difference between premise three and one? Boom. Here, in the universe, we see design. It's very empirical. It's very a posteriori. And you're dealing with particular instances of it. But why should we make the leap um, to all things work that way or all like things work that way. And so we're going to have to establish, we're going to have to argue this on maybe different or analogous grounds. And then fourth, therefore, the design in the universe as a whole implies, so three implies the same thing, designer of the whole. You could just make it two premises and a conclusion. I want to do that to, you know, we've got limited time here and I want to uh, deal with the, I want you to be aware of the, the um, accusation of part to whole fallacy. Okay? All right. I already said that, blah, blah, blah. But this is the obvious objection, I think, the part to whole fallacy. Uh, from particular instances of design to what we ought to conclude about the universe as a whole. So the third premise, in my opinion, is necessary to put in there. Contrary to popular belief, Paley's analogy does not stop at the watch. I said Paley was not a dunce. Um, he moves from there to consider a second watch found, one that we discover was produced by the first. Interesting. Suppose you found a second watch, and you came to find that the second watch was entirely explainable in terms of the first. And by entirely explainable, all I mean is it was made from the first such that its nature was already in some way um, programmed, I'm cheating, programmed into the first. I'll give you a little clue as to why Paley's doing this. Paley's not dumb. He knows that this objection is going to be leveled against him. Namely, well, what if you had natural design? So even Dawkins and others will talk about design. Some evolutionists will say, uh, Michael Shermer even did this in a debate with Stephen Meyer, of course it's designed. By nature, the blind watchmaker. Okay, and so Paley, Paley knew that. He knew that that, well, what if you put an infinite series of watches next to each other, one of which produces the other? This is an analogy, by the way. Throw koala bears in there. Okay, you get the idea. Or whatever species they came from, right? And so that's sufficient. That's kind of where they're going. And so what Paley does here is he fields eight very similar objections right away in that, uh, I think at the end of the first chapter, maybe the second, um, each of them anticipating various elements of naturalistic explanation. By the way, how are we doing on time? Because uh, my watch is nowhere. 745. 745. Speaking of watches, I did not intelligently design my, my exit strategy of this class. Um, but the, those eight objections that he anticipates are summarized in the following ways. This is just my ways of saying it to make it short and sweet. Number one, nobody was there to witness the process of design. That could be one objection there. Two, occasional failure and constant imperfections, and that's a huge evolutionary objection to design. Defects. Three, many parts not yet revealing how they contribute to function. So vestigial structures, other things like that, that you say, uh, oh, it looks like a tail. It looks like a tail as they're developing in the womb. Anyway, stuff like that or waste. Uh, so it's not apparent how this, how does that function toward design? <laughs> As if that's a, sounds like a question. Uh, sounds like a confession of ignorance. Anyway, he, he anticipated that. For the same form might just as well function in innumerable other structures, and many in fact do. So you have, you see common design, I see common descent. Tomato, tomato. Uh, number five, the principle of order is inherent to the structure's reproductive capacities. That's the one he was dealing with with that second watch. In other words, what if, what if it comes from the, the nature of what came before it? And then we can call that design. That's intricate. Six, mechanism is no evidence, but only motive to think it so. You'll see, I'll bring this up in a second, apparent design and what that means and doesn't mean for the evolutionist. Seven, some law caused it to be so. Such laws prescriptive, not merely descriptive. So in other words, it's taking David Hume's or others' laws of nature as, um, as causal. Um, well, the laws of nature did that. Okay, we'll, we'll come. And then objection number eight, and you still see it today. Basically, you don't know what you're talking about. You lack the scientific expertise, the scientific consensus, the wizard behind the curtain. I mean, the scientific consensus. Uh, that'll come up as well. 
All right. In applying his own argument, one more thing from Paley, and we'll cover some of this in a second because it's just worth covering. Paley employs an analogy combined with a greater to lesser argument, and then he gives us the upshot of it in sort of a, if you're familiar with a little bit of logic, a modus ponens argument, which is a very simple form of argument. I'll write it up on the board. I'll do the part to whole thing again. Um, the, the analogy he uses is of the eye and the telescope. Yeah, right here. A little art. We're going to do some art tonight. I don't know. Whatever. There's the analogy. One to the other, the eye and the telescope. And he picked a good one because Darwin struggled with the eye. Um, I don't know if he struggled with it partly because of Paley's argument or just on his own. No clue. Um, but he employs this analogy. He then makes a greater to lesser argument. And, uh, and then he arranges it in a, a modus ponens argument is, is this. It's just, it's just Latin for way of affirmation. Um, basically, if P then Q, you establish that this is related to this in some way. Then you affirm this. You observe it, whatever else. Some authority, doesn't matter. This is true. So if this is true, this will be true too. It's premise one. Get them to accept that, great. You establish that this is true, boom, this follows. So it's a very simple form of argumentation in logic. And how does he set this up? Well, first of all, what does it stand for uh, in his lang language? If contrivance, therefore design. In other words, contrivance, what does he mean by that? All the parts fitting together, they seem to be purposed and they seem to be for function. Uh, in this overall process. So if contrivance, then design. Boom, contrivance, therefore design. You observe contrivance, you've established design. That's if, they've, uh, that's if they affirm the first premise, of course. But Paley says this, because he's, it's very predictable, there's gonna be a charge of a false analogy. Eye and telescope, no way. Uh, but, that, but that becomes a problem for the, uh, the skeptic, actually. Paley says, quote, the perception arising from the image may be laid out of the question. For the production of the image, these instruments are of the same kind. So what do they have in common? By the way, what's a false analogy? A false analogy is somebody's comparing two things, and on the relevant similarity, they're not similar. So a true analogy is one in which, on the relevant similarities, they are similar. So it's a pretty simple definition right there if you're going to call something a false analogy. And so he says, the instruments are the same kind. The end is the same. The means are the same. The purpose in both is alike. The contrivance for accomplishing that purpose is in both alike. So he, he's aware of all the differences between an eye and a telescope. But he says, in, in the relevant comparisons, they're right, but that's not all. From there, he argues, that the eye is actually far more complex than the telescope. And thus, evidence is a far greater intelligence for its maker. Again, I said Darwin read Paley and, and things like this um, troubled Darwin. And by the way, as we talked about last week, the, the mind troubled Darwin as well, uh, as far as how can he trust the thoughts that were just happen to be the survival traits of the ideas that won. Well, it doesn't follow that the ideas that won are necessarily the truer ideas. At any rate, uh, irreducible, oh, what? what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, I don't care, we're going. Uh, five minutes, five minutes. I just want to say what irreducible complexity is and, and the other one is. Irreducible complexity, what are we talking about? Here's what we're talking about. Um, it's a thing. Okay, you have different parts. It doesn't matter what it is. And it's going to be totally misleading to draw it in a circle. I mean, I could really go crazy and draw a cell if you want to, with the RNA and all the different things and the, and the different proteins and all the factory and translating the information. Yeah, but uh, we don't have time for that. Irreducible complexity. What is it? Uh, Behe uses the, uh, the, uh, the picture of a mousetrap, interestingly. So it's a much simpler picture. But um, in each living system... Um, including uh, each microsystem, like a cell. Each part is now understood to work in an integrated fashion, right? So the absence of just one part would render the system as a whole worthless. Now on the flip side, natural selection selects for functional advantage, right? And so let's say, again, grossly oversimplified picture. Let's say that this is the random mutation. It becomes B1 whatever it is, that produces some trait. Turns out to be a mutation, but it turns out that it has a survival advantage of some kind. The reproduction of that particular kind will tend towards survival, blah, blah, blah. But natural selection, when it selects on random mutations, selects for 
functional advantage. What's meant by that? Well, it's not just advantage in the survival of the species, but functional advantage means integrational function, meaning it can only function together with other parts toward that end. But if the other parts don't exist yet, we'll stop right there. Evolutionists could say, well, maybe they evolved together at the same time. Well, man, that's a lot. Anyway, so you, you can see part of the problem just on the most simple, grossly simplified level. But with each trait from the corresponding mutation, there is no functional advantage to the change unless it already works together with those other parts, right? And you can just see with the eye why that's a problem. You know, the first light hitting in some photosensitive spot, you know, what is that working together with? It would have to evolve together, all the parts to get all the parts together. That's a lot of random mutations and a lot of people, people, whatever the species is. Um, so th the problems only multiplied at the genetic level. The proteins leading to the assembly of parts are themselves irreducibly complex. So there's a lot of explaining to do, and again, that's uh, it, that's understating the case, but that's that's just what the idea means. Specified complexity is the great definition of intelligent design as a theory. A clear definition and a criteria is needed in any scientific theory so that the hypothesis can be tested by something objective. Okay, so there has to be that defining characteristic. William Dembski, in his book Intelligent Design, uh, says that, quote, intelligent cause is responsible for an effect if the effect is both complex and specified. And why both? Um, well... Um, there's an inverse relationship in any effect, effect X, whatever it is, event X, between the complexity of the elements, in other words, how many things need to be present, and the probability of its occurrence. The more elements that are required from the matrix of all the causes for the production of that effect, the less probable it is that X effect will arise, given the sum of all the other possible combination of elements available. And so what we're after here is more than simply, simply order or regularity. The naturalist believes in order and regularity. And in fact, he says that this is the very boring, monotone thing that evidences no design. The, 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 in fact, that regularity seems a kind of randomness and meaninglessness. Um, but this and its opposite, random occurrence, is going to be relevant when you start getting into information theory. What we're after is an ordering for function. And that's really what Paley meant by contrivance. Uh, the problem is, is that the, the, the British Natural Theology School following Paley um, didn't carefully enough observe this distinction, and they exalted sort of two twin pillars, contrivance and natural laws. And they let natural, and people were perfectly willing to hear about natural laws running things, and so contrivance sort of sort of went down here and natural laws started to swallow up the contrivance dimension. And, um, and that's why even a lot of early adherents to Darwin's theory spoke about it in theistic evolutionary terms. Well, this is the process God used. He directed nature like those watches in the infinite series. We'll see what's wrong with that in a second. And by a second, I mean after the break. So let's take a break. <laughs>